Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Pele Glendale, Tim Deputy, Brandon Brooks, and brand new patrons, Mara, Derek, David, and Christina. Four new patrons over the weekend. That's fantastic. Thanks, y'all. On this episode of DTNS, Nate Langston tells us how to automate subtitles for videos. Plus, Google wants to go head-to-head with Roku. And three geniuses walk into a startup. AI something something profit. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 23rd, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, lead writer and correspondent for Bloomberg Originals, Nate Langson. Welcome, Nate. Thank you very much. That's the first time I've heard my new job title spoken out loud by somebody really? other than me. Yeah. How'd it feel? Um, it felt like a like a giant hug. Aw. Yeah. yeah. It did. Yeah. I was Happiness, correct. they say, is a warm lead writer and correspondent for Bloomberg Originals. Yeah, it is. That's that's the old, that's the old saying. Yeah. I'd love it on a sweater. Yeah, I'm covered in birds today. <laughs> yeah. Your yeah, sweater always... has drawings of birds for audio listeners. Oh, of course. Yeah. Not everyone can see it. Yeah, I'm not the woman out of Mary Poppins covered in <laughs> pigeons. I'm just wearing a t-shirt. Although I, somehow I kind of wanted to leave them with that, uh, that image of you. Yeah. But uh, sadly, they would have gone to the video and been disappointed. Um, let's start, however, with the quick hits. Matt Mullenweg, not usually an angry guy, uh, took to the stage at World Camp US to criticize WordPress host WP Engine for things like disabling revision storage and not contributing enough to the development of the open source WordPress project that both Automatic and WordPress Engine uh, use to run their services. Mullenweg developed WordPress and his company Automatic also uses it. Mullenweg has even invested in WP Engine in the past and spoke at their conference last year, but his relationship apparently has soured a bit. He called on WordPress users to vote with their wallet, uh, did not specifically call for a boycott, but said, hey, Hostinger, Bluehost, Cloud, Pressable, they're all great providers who are hungry to give you good service. Kind of kind of uh, unusual to hear Mullenweg speak. He's, they must have done something to really get him upset. The U.S. announced a plan to ban Russian and Chinese software and some Chinese hardware from cars sold in the United States. Uh, an announcement claimed China could use tech from connected vehicles, quote, within our supply chains for surveillance and sabotage to undermine national security. The proposed rules would cover any piece of hardware that connects to something outside the car. So anything with Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, satellite, cellular, etc. This would effectively ban all Chinese cars from being sold in the United States since that all that stuff is baked in. If the proposed ban is adopted, it would go into effect for the model year 2027 for software and the model year 2030 for hardware. TechCrunch reports on a new software license issued by a half dozen companies recently called Fair Source. It lets developers offer access to source code, letting users modify it and self-host it, just like you would with open source, but you can't commercialize a competing product with it. The main example is the functional source license developed and issued by software developer Sentry. There's also the Fair Core license and the business source license, the BUSL, is kind of grandfathered in. It already existed, but they say it's pretty much the same thing as what they're calling Fair Source. Critics say the definitions in the license are a little too fuzzy for their taste uh, and they could possibly be changed with little or no notice so they don't love uh, fair source for those reasons but now if you see this bandied about you'll know what it means Late Friday, media reports began circling that Qualcomm was considering an offer to buy Intel. Analysts generally agree that the idea of considering buying Intel makes sense, but the idea of it actually happening seems unlikely. While Qualcomm and Intel have complementary chip-making businesses, of course, it's unclear if Qualcomm would want all of Intel, and it's very unlikely that Intel could split itself up in time for a deal. It's pretty wound up pretty tight. Uh, though recently we noted that Intel is making some moves to spin off its foundry business as an independent subsidiary, so not entirely impossible. Finally, uh, following any iPhone launch is the iFixit teardown report. Uh, and the star of the iFixit teardown this iPhone cycle is video of applying 12 volts of electricity for 60 seconds to the adhesive of the battery that makes it just pop right out and release for replacement. 
The adhesive stays good after this process. You can bond a new battery just by pressing down. There's also some good info in iFixit's teardown on the camera control button, which is an actual button that moves along with the flex cable. If you want the whole teardown, just head to iFixit.com. And the other big moment after an iPhone release is often DxO Mark's ranking of the camera. The iPhone 16 Pro Max drops from second place for the 15 to fourth place. If you're curious, the Honor Pura 70 Ultra has the top spot, followed by a tie between the Pixel 9 Pro XL and the Honor Magic 6 Pro. However, the iPhone 16 Pro Max did clinch the highest score yet for any phone's video recording performance. Google TV Streamer is a new slim set-top box on sale now for 100 bucks. Uh, they are not making Chromecast anymore, just the streamer. It's a flat wedge looking thing, slightly bigger than your palm. Some of the features available on the box are also coming to the Google TV OS. So if you have a Hisense TV or another one that has Google TV, not just Android TV, but Google TV's OS, uh, you'll be getting some of these improvements. Both the OS and the box have a home panel now that lets you see and control all your smart home devices with a remote or by using Google Assistant by voice. Uh, doorbell notifications can show up on your TV if you want. An ambient screensaver can show you your photos. Uh, you can also put in a text prompt and have an AI create some photos for you if you want. Uh, Google's Gemini large language model is creating summaries and season breakdowns for TV shows and movies. Uh, that'll also pull in audience reviews. A sports tab is coming to the For You section, and there's a grid guide now for the free channels. There's 150 fast channels in TV free play. Uh, Nate, I, I don't know what you use to, to manage your TV, but I'm curious if the Google TV streamer pulls you in any particular direction. It, it doesn't. I have to say that I do like the look of this, even though it, it does remind me ever so slightly of a training sock as viewed from a distance. <laughs> um, but, it, but I do think it's a very attractive box. I don't use them. I, you know, we're an Apple household um, pretty much. So it's Apple TVs for us. But I have used the Chromecasts before. And I have also recommended other people buy a Chromecast, particularly if they are not in the Apple ecosystem. But even if they are, I've advised it because they tend to be better value. Um, and normally with these sorts of products, when they launch, my question is, you know, is like, who's it for? Like, who's it for? But it's obvious. This is for anyone who uses Android, um, which also then now makes me think, well, who is the Fire TV equivalent for? It seems now there is a real easy choice. If you're iPhone, get an Apple TV. If you're an Android, get this. I, you know, now the interesting move is going to be in Amazon's to see if and how they they want to respond. Um, and I forgot the other question that you asked me, but uh, I think what you you answered it. It's Apple. I asked you which which uh, TV box you use, and you you yeah. said it's Apple TV, right? Yeah, that is the one. Yeah. I liked the simplicity though of just being able to plug in a little stick into an HDMI port. There's something rather easy about recommending it to somebody that they don't need to think about anything you just get the thing you plug it into the hole plug it into the power and 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 you're off now it even though it's no more complicated really it's not feels, even that much more expensive honestly no, yeah but it feels like something more um I, I, it, it is interesting because roku still has a dongle uh amazon still has a dongle so at google is basically saying Fine, we leave that cheap dongle space to you. Enjoy, have at it. We're going to try to stand up there with Roku, Fire TV, and Apple TV. Um, and I think you're right. I think they don't expect to necessarily sway that many Apple TV owners over because they're in the Apple ecosystem, but they think they might be able to pull away some Roku and Fire TV folks uh, or NVIDIA Shield which is kind of the premier Android box when you talk to people who really value it. Roger, I know you have an Android Shield, or, or, or I'm sorry, an NVIDIA Shield uh, that you use. I'm curious if the Google TV streamer is attractive to you. You have to unmute to tell us. Uh, sorry, uh, I, would, <laughs> I would say at this point, no, because the Shield... And the and and the streamer overlap on a lot of the functionality. In fact, Nvidia offers a few more uh, uh, bonuses. So from that point, probably not. However, if my shield ever bites it and I need to get another one, the streamer would definitely be in the consideration as a replacement. Because one of the things about uh, Nvidia's Shield TV is. While NVIDIA is constantly updating the software, the firmware, 
really hasn't upgraded the hardware in about four years. And I think they're content to do so because it is a very low margin product. And so as long as they can just pump it out for, for what they need, there really is no desire to improve it. And I'm wondering if Google will take a different tact. It's like, okay, there's a new whatever. We can upgrade the hardware uh, very easily and just stick the name Pro on it and charge you $50 more. And Google TV Streamer Pro, yeah. That, that, that sounds like kind of a Google move. Um, a- Apple not really monetizing its platform much. Uh, it's really delivering services. You know, they, they monetize it by selling you Apple TV Plus and then hopefully getting some purchases of TV and movies and stuff more that way. Whereas Google is not only doing that, uh, they're, they're trying to, to get you to watch YouTube and, and try to get you to buy movies and TV shows from their store, but they're also selling advertising on this thing. So that that is another consideration for folks who are a little queasy about advertising. Roku uh, and, and Google are going to sell the crap out of ads on their devices. Uh, Amazon is doing it to a certain extent too, and I imagine it'll, it'll ramp up. We'll see if Apple is going to do it uh, but that could be another reason. And I've heard of a few uh, Android folks out there who who do use an Apple TV. And let's be honest, Apple makes its money from the Apple TV by selling you the Apple TV. I mean, that thing's like three times the price of this thing. It's <laughs> it's one of the most expensive. I mean, it's brilliant. It's great. Um, but it, that like that's where the money's coming from, right? I mean, yes, they're obviously selling Apple TV Plus sure, and all sure, that kind yeah. of stuff too. But in the same way, that it is an exceptionally high margin product, um, and- particularly compared to the you know the Roku's as well. And I mean, there's the element of added performance with the streamer besides the 4K. I mean, but just having something that is more responsive, especially when you start inundating the viewer experience with with ads, the last thing you want to have is a customer like, oh, I couldn't get to my NMEX video because your Google ad totally crashed this app or somehow spoiled uh, the video experience. And you definitely want enough horsepower that kind of skims over all of that. The conversation you had about ads, by the way, pausing, you know, ads during the pause of a, of a, of a video that can get in the sea. That is, if that's this thing's like, you know, if that, if this is the Trojan horse approach to getting that into my living room, that will never make its way through my front door. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's not necessarily how Google wants you to see Google TV streamer, but you know, they're certainly going to put YouTube front and center. So that that's, that's part of it. Uh, they're not the only ones doing it, though. So it's going to happen on Apple TVs. It's just not going to happen with Apple TV's own app. It's going to happen in Hulu and Disney and other apps like that. Um, I I look at this and I'm like, they could have put this in a dongle. They didn't need to put it in this format because it's actually quite small. I, I, Ron Richards had one. He was showing it to me o- over a video call. Um, I think they just wanted to up their design chops, too, and make, make something that looked pretty uh, for people who were looking for something more than practical so yeah it's very attractive i mean it looks like a sock but it is an attractive sock a very attractive like heron preston or fear of god sock yeah like i'll take your word for that they sound like great are they bands or are these those are designers yeah Uh, all right yeah indie Uh, indie designers i mean i'm covered in birds what do i know yeah (laughs) what do i know i'm wearing beige uh let's talk about somebody who knows when to use beige and when not to johnny ive uh i don't know johnny ive might say never use beige just white from what we can tell but johnny ive the former apple design head is teaming up with OpenAI ceo sam altman and uh, Laureen Powell Jobs, the uh, widow of Steve Jobs, they are starting a new hardware company centered around, as you might guess, AI. Uh, Johnny Ive told this to the New York Times. This isn't a leak. The information had something about this a while ago. This is directly to the New York Times. Yeah, we're doing this. I'm designing the device, says Ive. Uh, Powell Jobs, Emerson Collective is helping with the funding, and Altman's role is a little murky, but one imagine it's also funding but adding some AI. The company also has former iPhone and Apple Watch product design head Tang Tan and former Apple design head Evans Henke on board. And in fact, if Henke rings a bell, he took over for Ive when Ive left uh, originally as Apple design head. There's not a lot of other detail about what this product might be. I've said a lot of stuff about generative models making things possible that software can't do right now otherwise uh, and making uh, complicated things easier, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Ives design company Love From's co-founder Mark Newsom said the product is still being figured out. Uh, So it sounds to me, Nate, like Ive and Altman 
are uh, brainstorming on how to put OpenAI's ChatGPT and other things in a box and what that box should be. Should you wear it? Uh, should it sit on your shelf? Should it be a shoe? Uh, they're, they're, they're playing with ideas. Um, but we do know that this this is the team that's making it now. Man, I mean, AI for shoes, that'd be great. I mean, it can't because AI has no soul. hey -o. Um, This is, I mean, this is Silicon Valley fodder in, in its purest form, isn't it? I mean, the founder, the CEO of OpenAI, the ex-creative head of Apple and the wife of Steve Jobs. I mean, this is going to get all the excitement buzzing, right? But, and I do think it's justified because obviously these are very influential people. They've made some incredible things. But I think when it comes to AI, one of the things that's worth keeping in mind is that like a good generative creative prompt, getting things right straight out the gate with the first prompt is very, very rare. It takes several iterations of that prompt before you get the usable end generative product that you want. And I think with hardware, we've already seen that that's the case. The, there was the pin. I forget the name of it humane, now. Humane, the humane Thank AI. You. Not the only pin, but that was the most famous flop of the pins. Yeah. And I'm I'm quite sure I'm not the first to make the comparison, and I doubt I'll be the last. And it was a and it was a valiant effort, but it and it was arguably maybe just too soon. But I think that even having the creative chops of somebody like Johnny Ive and the uh, the AI know-how of somebody like Sam Altman and the money and prestige that comes uh, with jobs you are, or rather the estate of jobs, um, there is still going to be the whole, well, who is this for? What's it going to be? Obviously, it'll be expensive, whatever it is, because it'll be brilliant. But I do think that we're going to have to hold judgment on all of this until we hear some more details. Right now, it's too easy to get too excited. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I mean, it's cliche isn't say wait and see. So I won't say wait and see. <laughs> Too, late. Uh, Too late. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. Uh, in, in my Substack newsletter, uh, the DTNS Substack, dtns.substack.com, I, I pointed out that this will either be a thing that people don't even remember, or if they do, they say, yeah, I remember when Ive and Altman tried to do a thing that failed, or it will be the thing that everyone will point to and say, oh yeah, there was humane AI and then there was rabbit, but the ones who got it right were that team of, of Altman, Ive and Jobs. Uh, and, and how could they not, how could they not have succeeded with a team like that? So I think that we're in that weird stage where we do have to, to wait and see, unfortunately, because I don't get the sense that they even know exactly what it is. Uh, you go to the New York Times, correct me if I'm wrong, Nate, because you want people to know you're working on this, perhaps to attract more funding or interest. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I would go to Bloomberg, of course. Of course. Um, but, um, but I'd also read the Times. And yeah, obviously, you would, you, would, you, would, you would absolutely do. You would do that and drum up some interest. It's almost like a very, very controlled leak. Yeah. You, know, you, you, con you control the leak of something to kind of gauge the reaction uh, and see how the world is feeling about what you're working on. Um, and but they should know as well that they are going they know who they are. They know the status of who they are. They know what people will think. And it's very high stakes, probably more so for for Altman, um, given I mean, he was once ousted from the company. You know, it, like there are times where I think I feel like he's he's playing with fire in terms of doing things that sort of take him away from the core focus. And if he isn't being taken away from the core focus, then maybe the fo his core focus is what's going to be in whatever it is that they make. In which case, what do you want a product to have the next generation equivalent of chat GPT in? I don't know what that is that isn't already basically coming to all of our devices. So it's the form factor that I'm going to be most intrigued to see and how it fits into the home or on the body or heck, maybe in the body. Who knows? Yeah. That's what. Is it going to be a hat? <laughs> is it going to be ear earrings? Like, yeah, I, I, I really get the sense that they don't even know that yet no. either. So i um, curious what they come up with. Uh, folks, I'm curious what you want us to talk about on the show as well. That's why we have a subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, R.W. Nash is over there suggesting maybe we want to talk about iPhone 16 Pro users having some touchscreen issues. I'm going to keep an eye on that one. Uh, but Motang suggested Matt Mellenweg calling out WP Engine. We did include that uh, in our quick hits. If you would like to have some sway about what we talk about on the show, go submit dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. 
If you are a subscriber to Text Message, uh, you might have gotten the extra message episode that Nate just put out uh, about his journey to making subtitles for a lost media, uh, lost TV show that was in a foreign language. Uh, and not only that, but he found a way to automate the subtitling process. Uh, pretty ingenious how you did this, Nate. Uh, tell us tell us why you were doing this and then tell us how you made it work. Yeah, I have a real fascination with ma tracking down and completing archives of long lost media. This is something that anyone who has tried to track down an old Doctor Who episode from the 1960s and found it in the attic of some deceased relative or something, I believe that's happened at least once, you know, that sort of thing. I'm one of those sorts of people. And I love the challenge of, of using my skills as a modern journalist with all the tools that we have for finding information around the web to try and track down all these things if someone somewhere thinks they did at one point exist digitally. And the challenge that I was sort of inadvertently set by the friend of a friend was to find the old series after MASH, which was apparently some failed spin-off of the very successful show, MASH. This series was spun off um, I think it ran for two seasons. It never finished its run. It was canceled before it finished. It was never rebroadcast in English. It was never made available commercially, never sold. So the only versions of this series that exist are ones that people have taped on VHS or possibly Betamax back in the day and have you know released as bootlegs on, on YouTube and Internet Archive and things like that. And all but two episodes that were made I'd managed to track down through the the YouTubes and internet archives and all those sorts of things of the world. And they're all just the usual sort of VHS rips, you know, that kind of thing. Um, then to cut a slightly long story short, I found that one copy was known to exist, but only in a quote unquote foreign language. No one had specified what the language was, but that it existed and that they had seen it on YouTube at one point, but it wasn't there anymore. So I ended up on a variety of websites, the language of which is I, I couldn't speak. One of them had a Russian uh, domain extension, and I found a copy of a different episode, clicked on the user title to see if they had the others. And weirdly, I was bang on. They had this copy, and I found the language wasn't Russian. It was Czech. And so I thought, great, this is the video, but it's in this language, which at the time I didn't know was Czech. So I downloaded the video and thought, maybe I'll be able to translate this somehow. And um, and then maybe I can do some kind of speech to text, and then maybe I can make text and make it into a subtitle. But that was a several stage process. So, it, so to be clear, this is an yeah. English language show that has been dubbed into Czech, and that is yep. the only copy you can find, is the one that was dubbed into Czech? Exactly. The original okay. does not exist. The only version that exists apparently is this version in Czech, which I managed to find. And so I put the video file, thinking I could just do speech to text, uh, into Czech text, that is, through an app that I use all the time called Whisper Transcription. It's a subscription app. Um, on the Mac, it's about 12 bucks a year, 12 pounds a year, something like that. And I use it for transcribing all of my interviews because it uses the Whisper uh, API, the uh, large language model that OpenAI developed, but it integrates it with the Mac's um, neural engine and things. So you can do it all locally using the GPU uh, and the NPU. It's very, very fast. It's great. I, you know, hashtag not an ad. I paid for it. It's great. I dropped this video file in, expecting it to only translate the language from whatever it detected, which was Czech, into text in Czech. It said, do you want to translate? So I pressed yes. And this thing started translating the, well, it started turning the speech into text and then the text into English. Mm -hmm. And then it let me export the text as an SRT file, which is a subtitle format that um, is used by many people, I mean, including YouTube and, and things. And to me, this was the most incredible use of AI that I've ever encountered, big personally, because it allowed me to not only figure out the language, but it also translated it. It also turned it into text and it exported it into a usable media that I could connect to the video file. And then when I played it back in VLC, I scrubbed through to find a little part of the video that would give me some clues as to whether the translation had worked because I didn't know the episode. I didn't know the, any of the storylines. And there was this one scene where there's a guy in a hospital bed and there's a priest next to him. And the subtitle at that moment flashed up father with an exclamation mark as the guy in the bed held up his hand to stop the priest talking. I was like, well, clearly 
not only is the translation everything completely right, but even the timing is spot mm -hmm. on. And so now I have this, you know, awful quality bootleg <laughs> video file that I personally have no intention of actually <laughs> sitting down and watching with a what seems to be a perfectly usable uh, subtitle track, uh, making it accessible to the people that I will never give it to because it's not mine to sell. But if I were to, and I'm just to be clear, I really am not going to do that. Um, you know, you could enjoy it. And to yeah. me, that was just a great use of two hours. So it was just whisper transcription that, yep. that did this for you. Yeah. Did you did you try to go text to speech from the captions next? Um, no, I just did. Uh, I mean, the, the app, this app in particular did the whole thing. I tried uploading it to YouTube. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty, pretty. Yeah. Um, just to see if the auto captioning would work. But um, but I, I didn't need to because the app just did the whole thing. And I just thought this is this is this is next gen. This is next gen stuff. You know. I just, it makes my mind go to like, you know, what if you can mark the speakers, uh, use 11 labs <laughs> trained, this is way too much work, <laughs> yeah. right? But use 11 labs trained on the actors' voices and like restore uh, oh. the performances somehow. Well, um, I mean, that would be amazing. I mean, for me, this was kind of, you know, it was, I, I ended up approaching it partly as a bit of a data hoarder and a nerd, but also with an almost academic approach. I just thought, you know, let's see how far this can go without having to do yeah, anything yeah. particularly special or clever with it. Um, and if the next step to that is doing that, then if, if somebody wants the subtitle file, it's, that I can give you. Um, but uh, yeah, and then go go nuts. Maybe maybe that is possible. That's fantastic. Uh, that, no, I was fascinated hearing you talk about this, and I, I was glad you wanted to, to chat with us a little bit here. If you have questions or thoughts about this, of course, uh, send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. In fact, before we go, we check the mailbag. Derek says, I just got the AirPods 4 with noise cancellation on Friday and just had a chance to test them out doing a Costco run, coincidentally, while listening to Friday's Daily Tech News Show. First, the most impressive thing is that the noise cancellation worked for me even without audio being played. I had them in my ears in the car beforehand, turning on the noise cancellation, and I could barely hear the engine running. In Costco, I was able to hear the podcast incredibly clearly and without all the background noise. All said, I'm incredibly happy with my purchase. Quite the upgrade from the first generation I had. Also, Friday's GDI was one of the best ever. Fish or nuts, Derek. You'll have to become a patron and listen to Friday's GDI to understand the fish or nuts thing. But uh, this answers two questions. One was a lot of the reviewers said that the noise cancellation didn't seem as apparent when nothing was playing, when no audio was playing. And I think what Derek's saying is like, yeah, but you can still tell. It still dampens things. Uh, and the other was some folks were like, yeah, okay, it works for music. Does it work for spoken word? And, and Derek confirmed on that as well. So I, I was listening to that episode while I was on a bicycle cycling through London, and I had the transparency mode of my AirPods, AirPod Pros on. And uh, it did make me think, well, that this would be the perfect solution. Yeah, I'm not going to buy them, but it could work. And then Jennifer wrote, I will usually listen to DTNS while driving my nine-year-old son to his music lessons. It's a bit of a drive, so he'll have iPad time in the car and I'll be able to catch up on podcasts. But we recently listened to the episode about invisible mice and he started commenting about how he watched a YouTube video about this. He got so invested in the episode, he made me promise to not listen to the rest without him. So now I am getting further and further behind on DTNS since his lessons are only twice a week. The horror. Thanks for all your great content and for providing a great source of information and entertainment. Uh, well, thank you, Jennifer uh, and Jennifer's uh, child. Uh, you're uh, you're both welcome to listen to DTNS at whatever pace you want. I, I hope he finds the rest of our topics just as compelling. Uh, like subtitling videos automatically. Nate Langsett, thanks for that. Where else can folks find what you got going on? Well, the main place would be what I do at Bloomberg with Bloomberg Originals. Just go to Bloomberg.com. You'll find those there um, and also on the YouTube channel for Bloomberg Originals. And I've also just brought back in a new form text message, my podcast, and that's at text, uh, UK Tech Show. Dot com. I do that with Ian Morris, and it's got a sl ever so slight, no, a little more feel, not by design, but certainly no, but by. but it's good. I like it. Yeah. Um, so if you if you want to get into that, please give us a try. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. Kaspersky has departed the United States and deleted its software from everyone's machines there and installed someone else's software in their place. We'll talk about why that's a good 
idea. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20, 100 UTC. Find out more about dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Sarah Lane. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>